start today's message, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. All the scriptures I give you tonight will be from the New King James Version. And we're going to start in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Okay, so Satan tempts Jesus. The word of the Lord says, And then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, Thank you, Richie. And the devil said to him, if, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written that you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written that he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered to him and said to him, It has been said that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Which means Jesus, I mean, the Satan just left Jesus for a while. He was planning on coming back. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is the temptation of Jesus. In the wilderness. So what about the temptation of Jesus? Could he have sinned? Could he have sinned? This perspective seeks to explain why the temptation of Jesus was real. And if he, as God's sinless son, was nevertheless capable of sinning. See, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way, but yet he was without sin. The temptation of Jesus reflected the Bible's concept of temptation, which is always basic and not complex. The word used in both testaments relates more to the testing of a person's moral character than to his bodily desires. Our culture reads into the word an excess of lust, greed, and ambition, and that, that is a derivative, not the essence of the character. That's why Jesus could have been tempted in every way just as we are, as it is explained in Hebrews 4.15. All the temptations we face can be summarized in the three that Jesus confronted and overcame. To put our earthly before our spiritual needs, to misinterpret scripture for personal purposes, and to compromise scripture for the truth of an apparent gain. The temptations of Jesus also prove that Satan had no choice but to attempt Christ's subversion. The devil knew that Jesus was the original and that he was only a created being. Neither combatant mistook the creature for the original authority in the universe. See, Satan knew that Jesus was the authority, but he also knew that Jesus was in the flesh. The fact that Satan tempted Jesus and not vice versa proves who was in charge and who only wanted to be. 
Jesus held in trust from God all the spiritual truth that the devil wanted and intended to take by deceit or by force. But no question existed but that Jesus, not Satan, possessed all of the authority. What this scripture is telling us right here is that Satan has no new tricks, you guys. All he can do is tempt and try to trick us, but he has no power and authority over us. Because he didn't have power and authority over Jesus. But when he said here, when he tells Jesus that all these kingdoms will I give you, because they have been given to me and I can give them to whoever I want, if you would only bow down and worship me. And you know what? The enemy does that to us today too. You know what? I'll give you a better job that pays more money. I'll allow you to get approved for a bigger house. I'll allow you to get approved for a brand new car. And it seems like a blessing at the time. But then when we're struggling to pay our mortgage payment, to pay a payment on a brand new car that is beyond our means, then we have to find ourselves working overtime. We can no longer come to church on Wednesdays. We can no longer come to church on Sundays. Why? Because we find ourselves so overwhelmed with what seemed to be a blessing, but wasn't. Mm -hmm. Each came as representative of his cause. Satan, the enemy, and Jesus, the champion of humanity. Satan intended to keep humanity chained to its ego by binding Jesus to his. Jesus intended to destroy the devil's power over the human ego by submitting his, his will to God's will, however much it would cost or however long it would take. See, Jesus was determined. And, and what we learn from, from Jesus being tempted in the wilderness is that Satan will always come at our weakest moments in life is when he comes the hardest. When we're down, he loves to kick us when we're down. He's a coward, he has no new tricks, and he knows that the only thing he can do is trick us in to giving him our soul. He has nothing else, he has no power and authority over us. The personal face-to-face -face confrontation was essential since Jesus determined to put Satan on the way to the ultimate destruction, allowing him to go personally unbeaten while working, while working the disasters that he caused he would let Satan create greater evil than an exhausted virtue could ever solve to ultimately destroy the devil's work. Jesus first defeated him, which means that Jesus offered Satan no sympathy, whatever, and made no effort, whatever, to convert him. The temptation of Jesus proved that God gave Satan every possible advantage in the conflict. First, the environment of the lonely desolation. Jesus had been in the wilderness for 40 years, 40 days, I'm sorry, by himself. Jesus had to personally resolve the single question. Would he fulfill his role as God's son according to God's will? God had acknowledged Christ as his son when he emerged from baptism and then ordered the testing of his son's commitment. See, many times we're going to trial through trials in our life and we think that every time it's an attack from the enemy and that's not true. That's not biblical. Many times the Lord will allow us to go through trials and temptations to prove our heart, to test us. And it's hard in the testing. It's not an easy thing to when we go through testing. Trust me, my husband and I have been there. And then second... God allowed Satan the offensive during those 960 hours. 960 hours Jesus was in the wilderness by himself. To earn the right later to crush the devil with God's truth. Jesus exposed himself to every possible satanic attack. Relentlessly day by day, night by night for 40 nights and 40 days straight. Third, God reduced Jesus to a physical and mental exhaustion. And most open to Satan's attacks. The exhaustion gave the devil his most strongest opportunity. If Satan didn't convert it, it never would another, there would never be another opportunity like this conflict 
determined to determine whether Jesus or Satan would win the war between them both. The temptation of Jesus focused on Satan's determined effort to keep Jesus from the cross. He didn't want him to die. Whatever interpreters think, he desperately sought to keep Jesus from the cross, for he knew that by Christ's death, he would destroy evil, death, and Satan himself. The proof of this desperation was his willingness to compromise with Jesus by letting him rule in morality and virtue so long as he didn't rule in the blood-bought righteousness. The temptations of Jesus were all answered by the master's resort in scripture. The reason is obvious. Satan had no answer to God's word. He would have loved to debate philosophy with Jesus or why Jesus could say, or why God could say that he loved Jesus, but still let him suffer. Or why God would claim to be a sovereign and good God, but still allow people to suffer. Satan could have brought up many arguments before Jesus, but he knew in the end he would not win. Jesus declined these arguments. The master gives us a perfect response to any temptation. Shield life with God's word. See, Jesus knew, and we need to understand, that God's word through the Holy Spirit is the most powerful weapon that we have against the enemy. If God's word cannot change the circumstances in your life, if bringing in the power of the Holy Spirit to help you through your storms and trials, you don't believe that that's enough, then it won't be enough. The temptation of Jesus ceased, but only, notice it says that only until another opportune time. Obviously, Satan would return throughout Christ's ministry, through demon-possessed people, through leadership, through his own family, through his disciples, and finally in the colossal struggle in Gethsemane. No matter how badly mauled Satan is or however strongly he is opposed, he won't admit defeat and insists that he can yet find a way to defeat us. Constant vigilance is also the price of our spiritual freedom. See, when Jesus came to set us free, he didn't come to set us free so that we could do whatever we want. He came to set us free so that we could do the perfect will of his Father, so that we can continue the work that he started. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and Jesus comes back to him, for it is written, for it is written, Jesus fought Satan off through Deuteronomy 8. All the weapons that Jesus used to fight off Satan is in Deuteronomy 8, one chapter. One chapter. And I'm going to read that now, and it's, it's De Deuteronomy 8, and we're going to start in verse 1. Let me get off of this chair, it's too tall. And the word of the Lord says, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all, led you all the way out these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you. Okay, the people the that went through the wilderness, God's people that went through the wilderness for 40 years, and it was so that God could lead them and tempt, have them be tempted and test them, to test their heart. And this is the same thing with Jesus. When he came out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to test him and to try him and to prove him worthy. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. 
So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger, and he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you known, that he might make known that the man man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Man. But man lives. Your garments did not wear out, nor did your feet swell these forty years, says the Lord. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord God chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and of springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of those hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and you are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Amen. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments and his statutes, which I have commanded you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who led you through the great and terrible wilderness. Isn't that awesome? The, the way that the Lord allows us to go through trials because he's strengthening and testing our heart in which fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water who brought you out from a flinty rock who fled you in the wilderness, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good in the end. And then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. And then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. And the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. See, so you can see in these scriptures where Jesus got these scriptures and this is what he used to defeat Satan in the wilderness. Because here where the Lord says, that after you have gained all this, then you say, by my hand, I have all this. I work for this. I got this. This is because of me. And then pride swells in your heart and you forget about God. But the Bible says that every good thing comes from the Lord. Amen. Okay, so the times that Jesus told Satan, for it is written, for it is written, and for it is written. He got it from Deuteronomy 8. But then you remember that Satan came back to Jesus. And see, Satan knows scripture. So he came back to Jesus with scripture. Satan knows how to come to us with scripture. He might twist it a little bit. So he came to Jesus and he told him to jump off of the high pinnacle. Because anyway, he says, for it is written that he will give the angels charge over you. And they will lift you up on their hands, lest, lest you dash your foot upon a stone. So does anybody know what scripture Satan was quoting from when he said that to Jesus? The one in the Bible. Yes, one in the Bible. Thank you, Lucha. That's amazing. I taught you well, Lucha. Uh, uh. See, 
Satan knew that Jesus was going to rule over the throne of King David. So he comes to a scripture, he comes with a scripture to Satan that is dear to Jesus because this is considered a psalm of King David. So in Psalms 91, verses 11 through 13, the word of the Lord says, For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all of your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. See how Satan will come, and he'll, he'll use a little bit of scripture, but he won't use the complete scripture. This is where we have to be careful. It's kind of like that scripture everybody uses. For now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And they end it there. But they don't finish that scripture. Which says, for those who walk according to the word and not according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. See, so Satan didn't finish the scripture. He, he quoted to Jesus what he wanted to quote, but he didn't finish it. Because after it says, Nash you dash your foot against a stone, verse 13 goes on to say, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. See, Satan knew that Jesus had the power to trample him underfoot. And this is why he didn't finish the scripture. He just used the scripture that was convenient for Jesus at that time to tempt him. And that's what he does to us. If you don't get into the scriptures and you don't read the scriptures and study the scriptures and burn the scriptures, Satan's going to come to you one of these days and he's going to tempt you mm -hmm. with a partial scripture. One that sounds pretty, but he's not going to finish the whole thing. And if you're not wise in the word, he's going to fool you and you're going to fall into temptation. Next, we're going to go to John 14, 30 through 31. John 14, 30 through 31. And the word of the Lord says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. Okay, let me stop. Let me back up a little bit. After Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, when the temptation was ended and he came out and began to choose his disciples, the apostles, and after they were with him, they walked with him in the ministry and they saw him do miracles and they saw him do all these things, you know, the lame walked and the blind saw and he raised the dead and, and they saw all these miracles. And then it came a time where Jesus knew, okay, you know what? My ministry is almost ended. So I need to begin to tell them what's going to happen. I need to begin to prepare them. And so Jesus begins to tell his apostles what's about to happen, what's going on. And, and so in John 14, 30 and 31, he tells them, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me a commandment, so I do. So arise and let us go from here. See, Jesus was preparing them and he was saying, you know what? The evil one is coming. But he doesn't have anything in me. But he began to let them know, and you know what? I really believe that Jesus prepared Mary also as his mother. I can only imagine Jesus talking to her and say, hey, you know, this is what's gonna happen. Because the thing is that when they were waiting for the Messiah that day, in that day, they were believing that the Messiah was gonna come in all of his glory, okay? They, nobody ever expected a little baby born in a stable. They thought that the Messiah was going to come down in all of his glory and greatness with chariots of fire. And he was going to rule in the, in the palace of King David forever and ever. That he was going to tear down 
the government and build it back up. So they didn't expect what Jesus was telling them was going to happen. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. But the plan that you guys think is going to happen is not going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And I can only imagine the reaction like I don't understand. How, how, how would God allow you to be arrested, to be beat, and to be crucified? How would he allow it? I mean, the, don't the scriptures say that the Messiah was coming to sit on the throne of King David forever and ever and ever, and of that kingdom there would be no end? I mean, we don't understand. And I can imagine Jesus telling them, you don't have to understand. This is how it's going to happen. My father has a plan. I came here. I do nothing of myself. I only do what my father has sent me to do. And throughout the scriptures and the ministry of Jesus, he even said, I don't even speak of myself. I speak what my father tells me to speak. And so many times we don't understand, okay, this is going on in life and I don't understand how God's going to work this for good. I can't see it. We don't have to see it. Mm. We don't have to understand it. We just have to trust that he has our best interest and that he's going to work all things, all things in our life for good. So then Jesus speaks to them in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, and Jesus predicts his death and his resurrection, and he begins to speak with his disciples and apostles, and he begins to tell them all these things that must happen. So he begins in 31, and, and it says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He spoke this word openly. And then he took Peter, took him aside and he began. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. When Jesus began to tell him these things, Peter is the one that rose up and said, I'm not going to let it happen. I'll fight. I'll fight. I'll defend you. I'll, I'll die with you. I'll go to prison with you. Well, Jesus is the one, and Peter is the one that denied Jesus three times. But when, when Jesus rebuked him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. That was another time that Satan came to Jesus to tempt him. Because see, Jesus began to speak the plan of the Father. This is what's going to happen. And I can only imagine Satan in a corner somewhere listening, okay, so now I know this is going to happen. So how am I going to stop it? Okay. And Satan didn't fully understand the purpose of God. But all he knew is that what Jesus is speaking, what he's saying that the Father sent him to do, this is what I have to stop him from doing. Because if I don't stop him from doing what God sent him to do, this isn't going to be good for me. So as the end of, this is why it is so important, and I tell my girls in Bible study all the time, watch your words. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Watch what you're saying. Watch what you're speaking. Watch what you're confessing. Because the enemy is always around the corner listening, grabbing your words. And those words that you speak, whether death or life, he can take them to his advantage. Because the ones that you are speaking death, he can come and that's a spiritual door. He has spiritual authority now to come into your life and to manifest what you're speaking. Okay? But then if you begin to speak good things, he also comes and says, okay, how can I take partial scripture and apply it to your situation now so that I can deceive you and make you think that it's God speaking to you? But it really isn't. 
So this is why we really have to be careful and watch our words because the enemy will use them. I mean, he did it to the Son of God. He used scripture trying to fool the Son of God. What do you think he's not going to try to do with us? This is like, you know, like my, my in-laws say, ojo pelon, all the time. You have to be keep your eyes wide open all the time. Because he'll come in and he'll give you that sucker punch. You know, the thing is that the important thing about us as adults really learning the Word of God is so that we can teach it to the younger generation, so that we can teach it to our children, so that we can teach it to our neighbor's children, so that we can teach it to anybody that's willing to hear. It is so important because let me tell you something. You can raise a child up in church. You can teach the children scriptures. But if you're throwing some lies in there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach about this next week. I'm preparing a sermon. If you're throwing a few lines in there, a few lies in there in between, and we've all heard it. Okay? If you smile like this for a long time, your face is going to get stuck. That's a lie. Sometimes we try to scare our kids and, and we create lies and then when they grow up and they take off to college and, and they have professors that are trying to get that mentality, that Christian mentality, that godly mentality out of them. And they find out that all these years you were lying about certain things. They're going to begin to doubt whether or not you were lying about the word of God too. The enemy has a cunning way of coming against our children. The last scripture I'm going to go to is Luke 23. Does anybody know? Okay, after Satan left Jesus in the wilderness, and yes, he came through demon-possessed people and, and things of that sort. But then we see clearly where he came and, and he tried to stop the plan of God through Peter's mouth. Because Peter had a big mouth. You can go through the scriptures and read Peter's life. And, and, and he, had, he had a big mouth. He had a temper. He was dealing with pride, stubbornness. Um, but can anybody tell me When's the next time after Peter that Satan came back to tempt Jesus? Does anybody know that scripture? Pastor? Richie? <laughs> Does anybody know the scripture? That after, after Satan came and used Peter's mouth to try to stop Jesus from going to the cross. Wasn't it when um, Pilate was questioning him? Close. Almost. Let me read you. You're going to recognize Satan in this scripture. We're going to go to Luke 23. 32 through 43. And this is Satan's last attempt. To stop the purpose. That God had intended for Jesus' life. <laughs> Luke 23. 32 through 43. And the word of the Lord says. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they were crucified with him and the criminals, one on the right hand and one on, and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ and the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocking him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Stating, this is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals, who was also hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If 
You are the Christ. Save yourself and us. You see three more times. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Christ. <coughs> Satan was desperately, desperately trying to get Jesus to yell out and call a legion of angels to come and take him down from the cross. And he used anything he could use. He used the soldiers. And he even used the, the thief that was hanging next to him. So the other one answering rebuked him saying, Do you not even fear God? Seeing that you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And we know the rest of the story. Jesus was taken down from the cross and, and laid in a tomb that was carved out on the side of a mountain, a cave. Isn't it amazing that Jesus being the Son of God was in heaven in all of his glory and majesty. And he chose to come down. He chose to come down. And he was born in a stable. And if you go back and research it says that that stable was kind of like a rock, a, a rock hewn. There was a cave hewn in a big rock, and that was a stable where they would keep the spotless sheep from the wolves, from the lions, because the sheep were to be sacrificed in the temple for the remission of sins. And in that stable, the perfect, beautiful, spotless Lamb of God came down and he lived a sinless life for 33 years and he obeyed his father even unto death and he went to the cross and when they took him down from the cross, they put him in a tomb hewn in a rock. The same caves, the same mountains, the same stones, the rocks that he created him, received him when he came to the earth. Yet us as humans had no room for him. And when he lay in that tomb that he also created as the son of God, because he was with God in the beginning, it received him after he died on the cross. And that same tomb became a waiting room as Jesus descended down into Hades. And it says that he went and he took the keys of hell and death from Satan. Because the scriptures say that he came to set the captives free. But the Bible also says... That Jesus came to set the captives free and that the truth that we know will set us free. Many people say the truth will set you free. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that the truth that you know will set you free. If you never open your Bible, if you never study the scriptures, if you don't know what is promised to you, if you don't understand the power that has been given to you, you won't be free. There's a difference between coming up here to the altar and accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior and being free. There's men in prison right now behind bars, some of them even doing life, that have more freedom in there than they had out here because out here they were bombed in spiritual chains and shackles and they didn't even know. So the Bible says that the truth that we know will set us free. 
We have to know, we have to learn, we have to study. See, God says, seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. It's about him, not about us. If every time we come to the Lord in prayer, it's just about help me, give me, save me, do for me, give. That's not prayer. That's going before God with a selfish ambition, just saying, I need, I need, give me, give me, give me. When true love is not receiving, but it's giving. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So when we come to God with a true repentive heart every day and we say, Lord, give me the strength to stand and to do whatever you have prepared for me today. Help me to serve you. Teach me to empty myself as a vessel so that you can fill me up with your Holy Spirit. And when we begin to do that, there comes a difference in our life. There comes a power in our life. That we can't even understand because it's not about coming to the altar yes the Holy Spirit comes and cleanses of our sins and the blood of Jesus covers us but let me let me tell you something these apostles these disciples walked with Jesus through his ministry for three three and a half years Jesus sent them out two by two. They had accepted Jesus as their master, as their rabbi, as their savior, as their Messiah. Exactly what we do when we come here. And they walked with him and Jesus sent them out two by two and they went out. And they cast out demons and they healed the sick and they raised the dead. They came back in amazement and said, Lord. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, do not be happy that they're subject to you, but rather glorify that your names are written in the book of life. Right there, that scripture says that you have salvation. And even though they have been walking with Jesus for three years, they didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit yet. Because you go to the book of Acts. When Jesus resurrected and came back, he said, go. Go and wait. For the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then you will have power. First, we must walk with God. We give our lives to him and we ask for forgiveness. We repent. We accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We walk with him. He cleanses our eyes. He opens our spiritual lives. We begin to read the word. We begin to study. We begin to seek God. We find God. And then he shows us great and wonderful things that we did not know. And then we wait. Be still and wait and know that I am God. And when we're still and we wait. And after we've done all that we could do to learn his word, to learn the promises that are promised for us, to learn what we're supposed to do, to walk in obedience to his commandments, do all this. And then he says, then wait. Because the word of God says that he does not wish for men to circumcise their flesh like they used to circumcise them in the Old Testament. He wants us to circumcise our heart. And when he begins to cut things out of our life and we begin to say, hey, wait, I have unforgiveness for somebody and it doesn't feel good. This, this isn't right. So then we begin to say, God, help me to release this. Help me to forgive this person. We go to that person. We forgive this person. We, we, we forgive. We do what we have to do to get right with God. And though we already have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and the blood of Jesus has cleansed us, until that moment that you have searched for God with all of your heart, and you have found Him, 
and he shows you great and mighty things that you did not know. And you forgive everybody and you've done everything the Lord has asked you to do. And you purpose to seek him and you purpose to love him and you purpose to obey him and follow him. Then one day you're going to wake up and you're going to find out that there's a power inside of you that you never had to begin to release fears. You know what? My mother-in-law used to fear death until the Holy Spirit came upon her. She no longer fears death. There was many things in my life I used to fear until I gave forgiveness to the last person I needed to forgive. That last person that I was holding on to because the enemy would come to me and say, you're justified. It's justified. What he did to you. You don't have to forgive him. When he comes and asks you for forgiveness, then. But when I forgave him with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind and all of my strength, not only did I forgive him, I began to love him. I began to help him. Then all of a sudden there was a power that came inside of me. That I, fears, little by little fears began to leave me. The fear of my husband owning a motorcycle because the enemy would bring these images. Oh, he's going to roll over. He's going to kill himself. And I had a fear of him not buying a motorcycle. And that fear left me. Guess what? For his birthday, I bought him the motorcycle. Because when that power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you in that magnitude, nothing can hold you back. Nothing. You begin to realize that there's a living power inside of you. And I don't care how many bombs, how many missiles, how many meteorites, how many powers can come and destroy this earth. There's nothing stronger than the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the strongest weapon in the universe. The strongest weapon that we have to defeat Satan lives inside of us. It lives inside of us. And that power begins to get stronger and stronger as we begin to forgive and to release and to search the scriptures and to build a relationship with God and walk in obedience and begin to seek Jesus every day and just begin to love others like Christ commanded us. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that say? Love yourself. Love yourself. If you look at yourself in the mirror every day and you say, oh gosh, I'm ugly. I'm fat. I can't do this. I'm afraid of doing this. I, I, there's no way I could do this. That scares me. I'm afraid of this. Then you know what? You always will be. That will hold you down for the rest of your life. But if we do what Jesus set the example for us and when Satan comes against us and we say it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written that you will not have my children because if I'm saved, my whole household will be saved. It is written that cancer cannot overtake my body because by the stripes of Jesus Christ, I am healed. Not I'm going to be healed, not I was healed, I am healed. Man. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of us. Do we believe it or not? And when you take hold of that through the scriptures of God, your life changes. And there's no addiction. There's no fear. There's nothing that can keep you down. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because that's a promise from the Lord. Peter was hiding. Peter walked away from the ministry until the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him. And when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him, on that day of Pentecost, Jesus gave a message that over 3,000 came to salvation. And these were a lot of the same people 
that when Jesus was on trial, they were yelling, crucify him. That's the power. Because they went from, yes, loving Jesus, walking with Jesus, knowing Jesus, having salvation, but cowering in houses and hiding because they were afraid of the Roman soldiers. But when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, they didn't fear anything. They went out. And on the backs of their lives, we walk. They laid their lives down for the word of God so that they would lay a foundation for us, for us to walk on. But we don't respect that foundation that they set for us, that Jesus Christ first set. And then they were willing to die so that we would have freedom. This day, 2019, we would have freedom. We would have power. If we don't respect that, that they gave their lives, we don't really respect anything that God tells us in his word. Because think about it. Think about it, you guys. They gave their lives. Almost every apostle was martyred for their belief in Jesus Christ. And even to this day, as we're sitting here, the honor and privilege of bringing the word of God forth, there's Christian brothers and sisters in third world countries right now that are being killed because they're being found with Bibles. They're being beheaded, they're being drowned, they're being set on fire. It saddens me, it really saddens me to see not only this church, but many churches on Wednesday nights empty. And then we wonder why the enemy has an upper hand, not only in our home, but in this state. We're not taking advantage of what God has given to us through prayer. We have the power to defeat the enemy. But because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, because he went through temptation, because he lived a sinless life, because he went to the cross and he rose again. You know, this morning I was looking at pictures of Jerusalem because me and Pastor have been thinking about taking a trip to Jerusalem and I was looking at some pictures. And you go to the garden tomb of Jesus and there's a sign there that says, he isn't here, he has risen. Anybody else who has claimed to be a God or a Messiah, they're in a grave with their name inscripted on the tombstone. Only the tomb of Jesus is empty because he's the Amen. one true Messiah. Amen. And nobody can take that from us, you guys. That really should bring joy into our life. So as I began, I began to close I just want to say thank you to everybody watching by Facebook. We really appreciate your comments. And if there's any subjects that you would like us to bring, uh, please let us know. Message us or send a message through Facebook or YouTube. And we will get back to you. We'll respond uh, either with a comment. And if we're going to address the subject that you want addressed, we will let you know when we're going to address it. Uh, it's been a really awesome time. I really love bringing the word of the Lord forth. It's an honor and a privilege that I, I don't take lightly. I stand up here with fear and trembling because I honor and I reverence God. And because I appreciate what Jesus did for me. You know, the more, the more you've lived, the more you've sinned, the more you've hurt. The more you appreciate when Jesus comes and cleans and, and heals and I will speak his truth and I will speak his word until my very last breath. But it's a win-win for us. Because if the Lord calls me home, I win. And if the Lord chooses to keep me here to say, help save other souls, I win. The enemy doesn't have anything on us. Let's never forget that. 
I just want to thank you. Join us on Sunday morning also at 9 a.m. And on, on Tuesdays for the Hour of Redemption between 5 and 6. And also next Wednesday at 6.30. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Have a good night.